When we seek something that we really like or we indulge in it, like eating a little piece of chocolate, if we really like chocolate, there's some pleasure. But then there's a little bit of pain that exceeds the amount of pleasure. And it's subtle. And we experience it as wanting more of that thing. Okay, so there's a pleasure-pain balance. And I'm telling you that the pleasure and the pain are governed by dopamine to some extent. Well, how could that be, right? I said before, when you engage in an activity or when you ingest something that increases dopamine, the dopamine levels go up, you know, to a substantial degree. Where's the pain coming from? Well, the pain is coming from the lack of dopamine that follows. And you now know what that lack of dopamine reflects. How do you know? Well, earlier we were talking about how dopamine is released between neurons. And I mentioned two ways. One is into the synapse where it can activate the postsynaptic neuron. And the other was what I called volumetric release where it is distributed more broadly. It's released out over a bunch of neurons. In both cases, it's released from these things we call synaptic vesicles, literally little bubbles, tiny, tiny little bubbles that contain dopamine. They get vomited out into the area or into the synapse. Well, those vesicles get depleted. We can only deploy dopamine that is ready to be deployed, that's packaged in those little vesicles and ready to go. It's like when you order a product and they say out of stock until two months from now, well, it's not ready to be released. Same thing with dopamine. There's a pool of dopamine that's synthesized and you can only release the dopamine that's been synthesized. It's the readily releasable pool. The pleasure pain balance doesn't only hinge on the readily releasable pool of dopamine, but a big part of the pleasure pain balance hinges on how much dopamine is there and how much is ready and capable of being released into the system. And now it should make perfect sense why if you take something or do something that leads to huge increases in dopamine, afterward, your baseline should drop because there isn't a lot of dopamine around to keep your baseline going. So let's talk about the optimal way to engage in activities or to consume things that evoke dopamine. And by no means am I encouraging people to take drugs of abuse. I would not do that. I am not doing that. So certain things like cocaine, amphetamine, I will put in the classification of bad. I'm willing to do that. And other things are part of life, food, exercise, if that evokes your dopamine. How are we supposed to engage with these dopamine evoking activities in ways that are healthy and beneficial for us? How do we achieve these peaks, which are so central to our well-being and experience of life without dropping our baseline? And the key lies in intermittent release of dopamine. The real key is to not expect or chase high levels of dopamine release every time we engage in these activities. Intermittent reward schedules are the central schedule by which casinos keep you gambling, the central schedule by which elusive partners or potential partners keep you texting and pursuing on either side of the relationship. Intermittent schedules are the way that the internet and social media and all highly engaging activities keep you motivated and pursuing. And we can take this back to our evolutionary adaptive scenario where you are out there looking for water, looking for food, not every trail, not every pursuit, not every hunch about where the animals will be, where the food will be, where the berries will be. Not every single one of those played out. There's something called dopamine reward prediction error. When we expect something to happen, we are highly motivated to pursue it. If it happens, great. We get the reward. The reward comes in various chemical forms, including dopamine. And we are more likely to engage in that behavior again. This is the basis of casino gambling. This is how they keep you going back again and again and again, even though on average, the house really does win. You can transplant that example to any number of different pleasureful activities. If you're not a gambler and that doesn't appeal to you, I have to imagine there's something that appeals to you, something that you do repeatedly because you enjoy it. And almost inevitably, it's because there's an intermittent schedule. There's a intermittent schedule by which dopamine sometimes arrives, sometimes a little bit, sometimes a lot, sometimes a medium amount, okay? 
That intermittent reinforcement schedule is actually the best schedule to export to other activities. How do you do that? Well, first of all, if you are engaged in activities, school, sport, relationship, etc., where you experience a win, you should be very careful about allowing yourself to experience huge peaks in dopamine unless you're willing to suffer the, the crash that follows and waiting a period of time for it to come back up. What would this look like in the practical sense? Well, let's say you are somebody who really does enjoy exercise, or let's say you're somebody who kind of likes exercise but forces yourself to do it, but you make it pleasurable by giving yourself your favorite cup of coffee first, or maybe taking a pre-workout drink, or taking an energy drink, or listening to your favorite music, and then you're in the gym and you're listening to your music. That all sounds great, right? Well, it is great, except that by layering together all these things to try and achieve that dopamine release, and by getting a big peak in dopamine, you're actually increasing the number of conditions required to achieve pleasure from that activity again. And so there is a form of this where sometimes you do all the things that you love to get the optimal workout. You listen to your favorite music, you go at your favorite time of day, you have your pre-workout drink if that's your thing. You do all the things that give you that best experience of the workout for you. But there's also a version of this where sometimes you don't do the dopamine enhancing activities. You don't ingest anything to increase your dopamine. You just do the exercise. You don't do the exercise and expect dopamine to arrive through some what we call exogenous source as well. You might think, well, that sounds lame. I want to continue to enjoy exercising. Ah, but that's exactly the point. If you want to maintain motivation for school, exercise, relationships, or pursuits of any duration and kind, the key thing is to make sure that the peak in dopamine, if it's very high, doesn't occur too often. And if something does occur very often, that you vary how much dopamine you experience with each engagement in that activity. Now, some activities naturally have this intermittent property woven into them, right? We sometimes have classes that we like and other classes we don't like. We don't always get straight A's. Sometimes we don't get rewarded with the outcome that we would like. We don't always have the perfect relationship outcome. But understand that your ability to experience motivation and pleasure for what comes next is dictated by how much motivation and pleasure and dopamine you experienced prior. The reason I can't give a very specific protocol like delete dopamine or lower dopamine every third time is that that wouldn't be intermittent. The whole basis of intermittent reinforcement is that you don't really have a specific schedule of when dopamine is going to be high and when dopamine is going to be low and when dopamine is going to be medium. That's a predictable schedule, not a random intermittent schedule. So do like the casinos do, it certainly works for them. And for activities that you would like to continue to engage in over time, whatever those happen to be, Start paying attention to the amount of dopamine and excitement and pleasure that you achieve with those and start modulating that somewhat at random. That might be removing some of the dopamine releasing chemicals that you might take prior. Maybe you remove them every time, but then every once in a while you introduce them. Maybe it involves sometimes doing things socially that you enjoy doing socially, sometimes doing the same thing but alone. There are a lot of different ways to do this. There are a lot of different ways to approach this. But now knowing what you know about peaks and baselines in dopamine and understanding how important it is not just to achieve peaks, but to maintain that baseline at a healthy level, it should be straightforward for you to implement these intermittent schedules. For those of you that are begging for more specificity, we can give you a tool. One would be you can flip a coin before engaging in any of these types of activities and decide whether or not you are going to allow other dopamine supportive elements to go, for instance, into the gym with you. Are you going to listen to music or not? If you enjoy listening to music, well, then flip a coin. And if it comes up heads, bring the music in. If it comes up tails, don't. Okay. Well, sounds like you're undercutting your own progress, but actually you are serving your own progress, both short-term and long-term by doing that.